please welcome Aku and uh, his presentation on Subgigas Radio. Okay. Yeah, uh, good day everyone. Uh, my name is Aku, I'm Chief Technical Officer in Fibre Devices and uh, today we will speak a little bit about Subgigas Radio. Um, so, uh, what is Flipper Devices? What is Flipper? Uh, this is uh, Tamagotchi for Hackers that we've been developing for three years already. And uh, me and my team gathered a lot of different things, uh, a lot of insights on how different protocols structured, how different uh, systems built, and reverse engineered a lot of them. So, uh, today's agenda is uh, so we'll talk what is sub gigahertz in general? Uh, what is uh, physics behind the sub-gigahertz, what is radio, what kind of hardware uh, we will need, what kind of hardware is available on the market, uh, what you will be using or what you're already using and don't understand and don't yet know that it's sub-gigahertz, but you will learn it. Then we'll talk a little bit about protocols, about reverse engineering for those protocols and systems, about uh, a little bit insight on pen testing and how you should structure your work when you're analyzing those systems. So let's start with uh, what is sub gigahertz. Um, so first of all, it's uh, not a one thing. It's actually the broad spectrum of technologies ranging from very simple, something very complex and uh, sophisticated with a lot of maths on the inside. Uh, the one common thing that they got that it's, it's somewhere from zero megahertz to 1000 megahertz, to one gigahertz. And that's why it's called sub gigahertz radio. Uh, Normally, this classification actually continues. So it's like one, the first one is sub gigahertz, then you have sub three gigahertz, and then you have sub six gigahertz. And uh, next time when you will hear something like sub three gigahertz radio, most likely it's something in 2.4 gigahertz range, something maybe based on Wi Fi or Bluetooth or maybe some other technologies. And then for sub six gigahertz, it's uh, next generation Wi Fi and uh, Obviously, mobile networking is somewhere there. And um, there's no specific bandwidth, no modulation, no coding, no protocols. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, each of those topics. And we will start with uh, radio to up to one gigahertz. So for us, it means that we, we should, if, if, we, if we're analyzing those systems, we should search for a signal in a wide range of frequencies. So some signals may be quite difficult to find, maybe they have really limited power uh, and uh, you will need some specialized tools like uh, uh, directed antennas and amplifiers and uh, maybe good spectrum analyzer. So most of those signals can be found, actually can be found in some very specific ranges. Uh, we call it uh, amateur ranges, amateur bands, and uh, those bands basically doesn't require from you to have license to operate. In them. Some of those bands, like uh, 133 megahertz, is actually allows you to transmit quite a lot of power, so up to 200 watts in some countries. And there are some, uh, there are some exceptions uh, from licensing at all. Like, for example, if you have something very simple like a uh, key fob from your car, uh, most likely it's exempted from any rules and can transmit in any range from uh, let's say 300 megahertz to 900 or 1 gigahertz and uh, in some countries like for example in uh, in japan in uh, canada they do have uh, this exception some countries don't so sometimes it will be a little bit difficult to find those radius uh, there are some helpers for you. For example, if you if you have the device in your hands, um, there are two options that you have. But first of all, you can see like what numbers were, what what's actually written on it, and if you see FCC ID or some other mark that uh, belongs to country certification organization, then you can just Google it, and you will find like all information about which frequencies this device uses, uh, how it operates, uh, which what, what maximum power it get, no, stuff like that. Um, yeah, in most cases, those devices slow power, but not always. For example, in some cases, you may need like a lot of power if you're covering like a huge net, if you have huge network of sensors, you may want to have radio up to two watts or even more. So 
by no specific bandwidth, what, what do we mean that? Uh, there is a there's an equation uh, that describes, for example, if you if you want to send signal with some baud rate, if you if you have some amount of data and you want to transfer it in a specific amount of time, you need specific baud rate. And uh, the higher the higher baud rate you have, the more bandwidth you need. And uh, in most cases, uh, if we're talking about Internet of Things, things different sensors. They don't require a lot of bandwidth. They don't transfer so much data. So most of them will occupy really narrow space. And uh, finding those space will be, will be a little bit difficult, uh, but not impossible. So uh, also, there is no like generalization rules. For example, if we're talking about Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, you have like a strict channel map. And you know that device cannot operate on uh, like a channels other than describe it in original documentation. So in our case, uh, your device can operate in a very broad uh, spectrum of frequencies. And uh, uh, in, in some cases, channelization maps um, uh, made by vendor is it, a little bit uh, not obvious and difficult to find. So some channels. Um, originally do have like a channel map. For example, ISM band in 433 MHz is actually uh, standardized, but no one uses it. So what we say when, uh, when we say no specific relation, what it is. So in order like to pack your signal, you have some carrier, and then you need to modulate it to send your signal. So basically you have your data, you have carrier, you combine them, and then you have your radio waves bringing your signal to another uh, point where you receive it. So, and there are like a lot of different types of modulation. Some of them are very old, like uh, Bluetooth shift keying or on off keying. They're very simple, so it's basically on off transitions. You have carrier or you don't have carrier. And some of them are quite uh, sophisticated. In, if we're talking about Internet of Things, so in most cases, those transceivers are designed to be simple, reliable, and they don't use uh, complex simulation types that we use, for example, in Wi-Fi or other, or in uh, uh, LTE or 5G. So, most uh, common one is uh, ISK, amplitude shift keying, one of keying, frequency shift keying, 2FSK, 4FSK, Gaussian frequency frequency shifting, uh, phase shifting, and uh, chirp. Chirp is one of the most interesting ones. We will we'll talk a little bit more about it a little bit later. So, and when you have uh, like bit stream that actually coming into modulator and coming from the modulator, also there are like a limitless possibilities how you can encode it. Well, the most common one is uh, non-return to zero level or non-return to zero mark and uh, Manchester code. Uh, so you you will see how it's so when you when you reverse engineering protocols you usually can see that for example if this one type of coding or another type of coding and it's not very difficult to understand. So and no specific protocols. So a lot of devices on the market invent their own. They don't reuse something that like like things like Ethernet. They don't reuse anything like that. Uh, some of them are designed to cover big ranges, big areas. And they do have additional layers of uh, uh, protection, checksums, uh, error correction code, and things like that. Uh, and some protocols are actually one way. So there is only one transmitter, one receiver. And some protocols actually have a dialogue when you have uh, some payloads coming uh, back and forth. So and there, are, there, are new, there is a new generation of protocols, including LoRa which actually trying to build like a huge mesh network. So it's, a, it's completely different from what we've seen before and a little bit more difficult to analyze because you have so many nodes and uh, traffic routing between them is not always obvious. So there are some standards. Uh, at least uh, there were attempts to do standards. Uh, one of the oldest one is uh, Zigbee. It's, uh, it was mostly used for uh, Internet of Things before it actually became Internet of Things. Then we have a new generation uh, for Internet of Things called LoRa. And then uh, attempt by telecom industry to standardize the whole thing for themselves, uh, like 
and BO-7 BVP. And he said there are actually a lot of them. Uh, and some of them deployed, they mostly use it in uh, mm, like a really big installations when you need to track something uh, on the country scale. It's quite nice and handy. So let's talk about radio a little bit more. So physics. Uh, in order to do something, in order to start with sub radio, you need to start with a uh, uh, school. It's actually, um, what is radio? Radio is, a, is a waves, but what kind of waves? Electromagnetic waves. So what is important to understand that electromagnetic contains both electric and magnetic. So we have electric field and magnetic field. And it becomes important when we come to the radio uh, of some specific types of radio. For example, uh, if you're talking about UHF or feedbacks, they have coupling and they use both uh, magnetic part of the coupling and electromagnetic part of the coupling. And uh, uh, when you're designing, when you like choosing antenna, you need to understand like, which type you need. So uh, this is really a huge topic. Uh, I, will, I will be unable to explain it to you, but it is just something that you, you can learn by yourself. So let's start with antennas. Uh, we need to receive, so we have some system that we're trying to analyze and we want to receive its signal. So in most cases, uh, those systems uh, use uh, either monopole or dipole antenna. Uh, some systems that are made uh, handheld, they usually have uh, PCB antennas uh, on the inside. But they, they always have antennas. There is no devices that operate in sub gigahertz without antenna. So first thing that uh, you can try uh, when you're analyzing the device is to check is something like what what type it is, and uh, if, for example, you can measure the length, you can say what frequency it was designed for. For example, most of those antennas are designed for quarter of the frequency length. So if we're talking about 433 megahertz, so antenna length will be something like 17 centimeters. So also there are other types of antennas that are a little bit more difficult to find on the boards, like ceramic antennas. They they mostly use it in uh, higher ranges like 900 megahertz and upper. And uh, there are some flex PCB antennas that may be mounted somewhere on the uh, housing on the inside and then you have a wire that goes to your board. So about antennas, we can say that uh, uh, they vary by application. So what it means is uh, depending on what kind of network you're building with this uh, sub gigahertz radio, you may want to choose different types of them. So if you know that, for example, your device uh, is somewhere on the edge and you have in the middle of this area your, let's say, uh, base station, you, you want to use uh, directional antenna. You don't want to use uh, omnidirectional antennas. And uh, is it like omnidirectional? Is it trying to communicate into different directions or it's trying to communicate into some specific direction? And when you see that, you can try to like uh, analyze uh, how can I, where I can, where I should stand in order to get uh, this signal. It may come handy in some cases. So, bandwidth. Uh, some antennas design it. Uh, uh, so, if we're talking about high bandwidth, uh, we may want to have a high gain antenna. And those most likely will be directional. Those most likely will have uh, some specific structure. And uh, um, you also can spot it. And uh, yes, uh, another thing is a gain. So uh, comparing to isotropic antenna, you can see you can have like a additional plus six decibels or even more in some cases if you're using directional antenna. It's very handy. And sizes. Uh, so some devices are really portable. So for example, Flipper is portable and antenna that we're using is actually helix antenna in a very compact form. So, and uh, I guess that's it for antennas. Let's let's talk about next topic. So, in order um, to send something, we need carrier, and in order to have this carrier, uh, we need to synthesize it. And uh, we have some options. For example, the most simple one, and the oldest one is RC. It's a resistor capacitor circuit or LC, inductor capacitor circuit. And uh, those are in purely analog domain, 
And uh, the problem with them is that they are not very stable, and that's why we, you will be unable to find those in the modern devices. So most likely you will see some kind of crystal escalator, and uh, the most popular uh, transceiver that you can buy for a penny on AliExpress will be just the crystal escalator with a circuit that uh, actually pumping, and that's it. And the uh, problem with those uh, uh, crystal series is that they usually have one and only one frequency, and they're not uh, tunable, or they're not, uh, you, you cannot change the frequency in a software. So, and in order to get rid of this problem, we invented another thing that called uh, uh, phase locket loop oscillators. So basically, they took your crystal oscillator, and then they multiply it, and then divide it. And, the, and, and basically, you can choose like what frequency you, you want uh, just by in sending it proper comments in software, and then you, and then you have to have any frequency uh, that you want. And uh, most transceivers that you will find on the market right now are actually using some kind of basic log loop uh, synthesizers or fractional envelopes. And um, totally new topic, or not, not like super new, but we have software-defined radio. And there is a very specialized kind of software-defined radio where you have uh, uh, like digital to analog, analog to digital converters that can do, let's say, six giga samples. So what it means? It basically, it means for you that you can synthesize anything uh, from zero to three gigahertz. And uh, in some cases, you may find that uh, some systems, a very expensive one usually, uh, the one used for science and laboratory measurement, they do use direct sampling. And uh, they also can synthesize any kind of frequency, any kind of signal, uh, just by, it's like an audio card, but very high speed one. So, uh, modulations. So when we're talking about amplitude chip gain, so what it is, so basically, um, oh, I have, I have nice uh, pictures. Uh, so basically we have carrier, and then we have our signal, it's usually, uh, and, and in this topic we will talk only about the simplest version of those modulations that use like a one line input, so basically it's zero or one. The, the more complex uh, types of modulation actually can encode multiple bits at the same time, but we're talking about the simplest one. And uh, if you have, and you can see that when we have uh, uh, one, at our input, we, ha we, ha we can see the carrier. And when we don't, there is no carrier. And uh, a little bit more complex uh, option, when we have uh, amplitude shifting, so it means that we like a changing amplitude. So you, you will see some kind of amplitude here, but uh, usually m much lower. And that allows the uh, demodulator on the other side uh, to receive, receive the signal and demodulate it properly. And uh, uh, amplitude shift keying is a little bit more complex version of on-off keying. In most cases, the cheapest transmitters are actually using on-off keying. So frequency shift keying or JFS key, both of them actually using uh, frequency shifting. So what that means is that you have some kind of center frequency, and then you have deviation frequency. And uh, so basically what your transmitter is doing, it's switching between those frequencies. And uh, w when you will see the signal on spectrum analysis, you will see that you actually have two peaks, and you can see that sometimes it's jumping back and forth. Uh, and uh, quite easy to detect. And a little bit more complex thing is phase shift gain. So what that means is basically you have your synthesizer, and uh, at some point uh, when we're encoding one, we're shifting its phase 180 degrees. And, uh, uh, you can you can understand it by looking at uh, waveform. So basically, you will need uh, some kind of um, uh, software-defined radio for that. You will need waveform viewer and uh, tuning. You, you will see like a one frequency at the spectrum analyzer. But when you will use waveform, you will see that it's actually jumping. So the pace is jumping. There are more complex versions of PSK, but usually they not use it in sub gigahertz radio. And LoRa is my favorite one. Um, it came from birds. It actually came from, not from birds. Originally, um, we started to use it in uh, 
uh, in military equipment, in radar equipment. So basically, sweeping frequency allows you to track things, and it's um, it's not susceptible to uh, Doppler effect, and that's very important in some cases. And uh, the birds is actually using same kind of modulation. You can see the chirps that goes up and down. Uh, it's much easier to detect those signals. And you will not believe that it's actually allowing you, the using chip modulation, allowing you uh, to extract signals uh, below the noise floor. So, uh, for example, uh, we're using, in everyday life, we're using GPS. And GPS is a magic on itself. Extracting GPS signal from the radio waves. So, let's say, we have normal electronics that have, uh, like, uh, a noise floor is something like, something like 100, minus 100 decibels. And then you have your signal somewhere at minus 130 decibels. And you have to extract the signal from the noise floor. And uh, the same thing you can do with LoRa. LoRa is also allowing you to get really nice results. And uh, on the spectrum analyzer, it looks like that. And you can see, uh, so basically, this is a symbol. and uh, Extracting those symbols requires some, some really nice math. So there are three different ways how you can do it. Uh, the classic way I described it in the patent for chip modulation that uses operation on matrix system, uh, comparing it with uh, predefined signals. Then uh, in uh, discrete Fourier transformation, you also can do comparison. And uh, another one is with neural networks. And that's what BIRDs doing. They actually do it with neural networks. So how are transmitters usually built? Uh, so once again, we have uh, our oscillator. We have a bit stream that's coming into modulator. And uh, then when we have modulated carrier, uh, we send it to amplifier and then to antenna. So the pipe is very simple. Uh, you kind of need to understand it when you're analyzing, when you reverse engineering the device itself, when you're opening it and uh, you're seeing, for example, uh, those parts, it's it's very it's very easy to spot them. Most of them is actually quite big, and uh, uh, you can tap into different parts of the system to understand how it's working or which frequency it's using. It's uh, in many cases it's very handy. And the uh, receiver is a little bit more complex. So there are different types of uh, receivers itself. We will talk, and when when we're talking about modern one. We're mostly talking about uh, the one that uses supergate writing structures. And uh, what is supergate writing? It's uh, basically uh, you have your antenna, you have your signal, you have amplifier. Then your amplified signal goes into mixer. And uh, the frequency, the tuned frequency that you want, is also goes into mixer. And what it allows you to do, it, it basically it allows you to get uh, intermediate frequency, then filter what you don't need, then amplify it, and then you do the modulation. Uh, the pipe is uh, quite simple, and then you get bitstream that you can uh, uh, decode somewhere on your microcontroller. So, what kind of hardware is available right now? What kind of hardware will, that we will need for development and uh, reverse engineering? So, we'll talk about radio uh, for a penny. So, the cheapest transmitters that cost almost nothing. We will talk about transmitters receivers in purely an analog domain that doesn't have anything digital on its side. And then we'll talk about uh, transmitters, receivers in the digital domain that mostly uses software-defined radio architecture on the inside, and uh, some of them is actually exposing this software-defined radio to you. And uh, we'll talk about development tools and software-defined radio itself. So the cheapest one that you can find is actually cost you something like 15 cents, 20 cents. Uh, obviously, it's maybe maybe it's kind of good for testing purposes, but it's not for production use. So, transmitter itself is a really simple. It's a crystal oscillator that tunes on one and only one frequency. It's not very stable, though. So, but you can use it. It's kind of okay. And the receiver is uh, super. Usually, it's a super regenerative uh, uh, radio that uses two amplifiers and. This, this, it's very unstable in terms of uh, receiving, but for testing, it should be more than enough. Better option is actually to use uh, supergate reading, and you can see that actually both of them got uh, crystal, either crystal oscillator, 
or um, uh, X quartz that can be used for synthesizing frequency. And uh, in that case, you get much more stable uh, receive quality, and uh, it's still in an analog domain. It's still, there is no digital, it just outputs what it demodulates to you, and then you process it on your side. So, and like the latest generation, uh, it's usually integrated uh, transceivers. They have both receiver and transceiver and uh, transmitter and uh, a lot of different things on the inside. For example, usually it's got a driving circuit uh, for crystal oscillator. So you have, uh, for example, 25 megahertz crystal on the outside. And then you have a fractional PLL on the inside that synthesizes any frequency in the range of, uh, let's say, 300 megahertz to 925 megahertz for CC111. And um, also, this thing got software defined radio on the inside. The problem is that it's not exposing it to you. Uh, basically, all demodulation uh, and uh, packeting is done on the inside. So it is processing thing in the digital domain in software defined radio, but outputs to you only decoded data. Um, and it's get modem on the inside. So basically, it it solve it thinks. Uh, so instead of you uh, creating payload with preamble or proper coding, uh, checksums, uh, it can do it by, by it can do it by by itself. And it got nice interface like SPI A2C or UART, so you don't have to think about complex parallel buses and things like that. So, in case if we want to develop radio, not to reverse engineering, but develop radio, what we need, uh, like one of the most important instruments uh, for radio is uh, vector network analyzer. Uh, it allows you basically to analyze what happens in your radio path. It allows you to analyze if there is an uh, impedance mismatch in it and uh, kind of handy tool for prototyping different comp components when you, when, you, when you want to understand if they're working together good or not. Then uh, most uh, important thing in the field work will be a spectrum analyzer. Uh, basically, it allows you to see like which frequency got what kind of signal, and uh, uh, logic analyzer. If we're talking about digital signals, so when signal is demodulated, that's the point where you want to use logic analyzer. Oscilloscope in some cases, uh, when you want, and some oscilloscopes is actually can like catch the signal itself up to hundred gigahertz, but those are very expensive one. Then you would probably want to have software defined radio at least uh, maybe cheapest one. Cheapest one is actually it doesn't cost so much, something like 10 USD. And uh, a lot of specialized cables, amplifiers, balloon splitters, all, all those things w will be required for radio. And uh, if we're talking about like a brand stuff, for example, uh, things by HP, or maybe national instruments, or maybe a uh, case site, that will cost you like a lot. So the stuff that will allow you to analyze uh, frequencies up to, let's say 10 gigahertz will cost you 40K USD or even more. And uh, there is no upper limit, for example, if we're talking about uh, uh, millimeter waves, it will cost like a million dollars. And uh, since we are not developing such devices, we may want to have something cheaper. And there are a lot of uh, devices designed by uh, open source community, open hardware community, like uh, OpenVNA, LibreVNA. Both of them are cost less than 100 USD. Then uh, spectrum analyzers. For spectrum analyzers, you can use, let's say, HackerF1 is actually a good one for a beginner. It gives you pretty wide uh, range and uh, uh, a lot of capabilities on the inside. And uh, yeah, AliExpress is actually quite good in terms of finding cables, amplifiers, balloon splitters, etc. So, software defined radio. Uh, cheapest option available on the market will be RTL SDR. Originally, it's built on the chip that was designed for digital video broadcasting. Well, basically, it's a receiver that uh, um, receives uh, digital video broadcasting signal and then gives you it in demodulated form. It actually gives you a picture, but at some point uh, people find, found 
the community found that uh, it's capable of giving you raw IQ data from SDR part. And uh, they started to use it to for software defining radio. It's uh, just a 10, 15 USD. You can buy it almost everywhere. And uh, it gives you three megahertz bandwidth. It's not much, but uh, more than enough uh, for finding sub gigahertz signals. And uh, it's, it works in quite broad range of frequencies from 500 kilohertz to almost 2 gigahertz. The next step will be HackerF. HackerF is uh, this thing. Uh, originally, it was uh, designed as a proof of concept project for um, attempt to reuse some uh, consumer grade hardware for software defined radio. Uh, you may be remember that somewhere it was 10 to 12 years ago, there was another standard, uh, not only LTE, but another standard called WiMAX. And WiMAX was uh, pretty much the same. And uh, th there was a one vendor, uh, Maxim Semiconductors, who had been designing transceivers for WiMAX. And uh, they designed it, it to be, so it's basically software defined radio. And those guys uh, decided to use it for like a regular tasks. And uh, obviously, HackerF, since uh, we're talking about uh, by Max, it's actually got some very specific frequencies, and uh, it's not tunable into the whole range from one megahertz to six gigahertz. So HackerF uh, uh, designed a very elegant solution when you're shifting regions uh, from re different regions into the region that actually uh, possible to capture with uh, this chip by uh, this vendor. So. It's a little bit more expensive, something like 120 USD. And if you will add the uh, Portapak, so Portapak is basically the hat that allows you uh, to throw away a computer. You don't need a computer, you can do like recording, viewing on the device itself. And it, it also adds battery, so you don't have to worry about power source for the whole thing. Uh, the whole thing was supposed to be like 200 USD, and it's fully autonomous and it's got some its own problems. So it's open hardware, open software. Uh, obviously, we have to uh, learn how to flash it, how to update it, things like that. And it's not always trivial. But reward is actually quite good. It, it's really flexible. And with quite high bandwidth, it allows you to capture almost 20 megahertz of the signal. That's a lot. And then, what's most important, it's not only receiving signal. RTL is there, it's only receiving signal, but also allows you to transmit signal. And then it becomes handy when you not only want to capture and analyze things, but you also want to mess with it. And then we go to the completely next level. So there is a there is one specific vendor, uh, analog devices, a very famous uh, semiconductor manufacturer. And what's most important, um, they are the one and the only who are designing front ends for software defined radio. And they're doing it really good. Like uh, the cheapest option that you can find with analog devices is uh, USRP B series, B two hundred series, and mini series. And um, they actually allows you to capture fifty megahertz of bandwidth in a range from sixty megahertz to six gigahertz. And that is already like enough to emulate a base station. So basically, you can create your own. Uh, LTE or 5G base station based on this thing. And uh, it's simultaneously can receive and transmit. And uh, it's quite flat in terms of its characteristics. So there is no, so HackerF got its own issues uh, in receiving some signals on some specific frequencies. This thing is uh, very close to lab equipment. Not, not graded as lab equipment, but very close to it. And then we have uh, X series uh, by SRP that will be a total, total overkill for analyzing sub gigahertz. They allow you to capture 160 megahertz uh, of bandwidth, actually 320 megahertz of bandwidth with two daughter board cards. And uh, in the same range, 60 megahertz to 60 gigahertz, which also extendable in the unlimited ranges, but it costs like a lot. So only baseboard so costs uh, 600, 6K USD, and the whole stuff will cost you something like 10 to 20, depending on how many additional boards do you want? So, um, 
last two board base repairs actually uh, reference design reference design by ad and uh, there are other vendors that provide similar solutions and uh, analog digital analog devices uh, provides uh, like a two different ways of creating software defined radio one way is uh, using specialized front end that do super gadgetine on the inside so basically it's, it gets synthesized and then uh, do frequency shifting and then convert intermediate frequency and then you have something very very unique and powerful it's called uh, direct sampling so basically you have uh, your own uh, analog to digital converter but very fast one like uh, 6 giga samples 18 giga samples fast and those allows you to capture the whole spectrum from 0 to uh, let's say 3 gigahertz 6 gigahertz and upper uh, those products mostly use it in um, military uh, things and uh, in some science research things. Um, price for them is is not like defined, and most of those devices not very easy to buy. So protocols. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, what exactly we can receive. So let's start with classification. Um, so most subgigahertz protocols uh, starts with a really simple one. Is it static or it's dynamic? Dynamic. So what it means? So basically, a static protocols. Um, they just, for example, you have uh, your doorbell and you have a button. Do you need it to be dynamic? No. Do you need it to have protection? No. So what do you need is some kind of identifier to link uh, this button with the doorbell. And uh, it's that's it. So you have a static code, for example, 24 bits transmitted um, if you press button and then not transmitted if you don't press button. And uh, that's called static protocols. A lot of protocols on the market that do simple things like opening garage doors, enabling fans, they're actually static. They don't have any dynamic component in it. And then you have dynamic component, dynamic protocols. So what it means? It means that something is changing on the inside. So for example, what? Uh, for example, you have timestamps, or maybe you have sequence number that's changing, and then you have some kind of derivative function that uh, produces hash of, uh, let's say, secret key and this number. And then the whole payload becomes dynamic. And it, w w why is it important? It's important if you want to protect your system from replay attacks, and it's important if you want to add some kind of security so the key will not be extracted that easily from your hardware. Then we can see if those protocols have encryption or they don't have encryption. So most protocols that you can find, most protocols that you can find uh, on the market for simple appliances, they don't have encryption at all. Basically, they don't need it. But in case if it's car, so most likely you want to have encryption. You want to have it secure. You want to be at least somehow unbreakable. And uh, the most complex protocols in the market also two-way communication when one side, for example, initiates like, I, I want to open the door, give me, uh, for example, something that I can sign and then send it back. And then you can verify that it's me uh, that sent this payload and uh, signed it. And uh, most advanced car alarm systems, they actually build in that way. Also, uh, like uh, if, we, if we're not talking about uh, house appliances and cars. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, in Internet of Things area where you have uh, protocols that actually do like a lot. You actually have a full stack starting with the transport layer, then you have uh, IP6 for the IPv6, and then you have uh, routing level, and, and the whole thing is actually becoming a little bit more complex. So, common protocols. What, is, what we can say is common. So one of the most popular is Princeton. It's basically a static code protocol where you have 24 bits of payload. And the last four bits or last eight bits, for example, in many cases, uh, just assigning for buttons. Basically, those bits are buttons. And then you have uh, like a small number where you have uh, your ID, key ID. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not meant to be secure. It wasn't meant to be secure. It was meant to be used in doorbells. And that's what makes doorbells kind of susceptible to attack when you just 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 uh, brute forcing the whole sequence let's say you have uh, 
10 bits of unique ID. It's, it's actually not so, you don't need so much time to resource it. Then we have uh, Kemi and Nice. Uh, those I use it for uh, different garage door systems and uh, uh, tuck downs. And uh, they, uh, they started a long time ago. And usually both of them actually have different generations. The oldest generation been using purely static codes without any encryption on the, on the ID sense. The modern one trying to be some kind of dynamic, they, they, they do have partial encryption, but easily breakable and uh, still not secure. Then we have Secur Security Plus, and uh, let's say the word security, the, it, it's not present in real life. So the whole thing is uh, also a mixture between uh, half static, half dynamic, uh, with easily breakable sequence uh, for encrypting this uh, uh, sequence IDs. And then Megacode, also the one that uses it in the garage doors. Kind of not secure, I'll say. The only protocol that is trying to be secure on the market and do get some kind of encryption uh, is Keylock. So Keylock is uh, describing the full stack, uh, starting from the idea that you have uh, key lock encryption. So this is a 500 round encryption, it's somehow difficult to break. It's not unbreakable, but it's difficult to break. You need really a lot of uh, processing power. So for example, um, normal encryption uh, type requires two weeks on the video, on uh, like a top end video card to get this key back. And uh, uh, basically, basic idea is very simple. You have uh, some kind of key ID, then you have sequence number, uh, and then you have uh, uh, the whole thing, for a special word that all of them combine it and then encrypt it. And then you have this uh, part that uh, sign signature for this frame. And uh, on the other side, you need to know uh, same thing. You need to know, uh, for example, you start with a key ID, then you're searching for a, a record if you have this key ID in your database. Then you see, for example, if a sequence number uh, somehow in a range where it should be. And then you do like encryption for the whole thing and then compare numbers. It's plus minus secure if you're using it in home appliances, uh, but also was invented a long time ago and uh, a little bit outdated. So, and then we go to protocols that was actually standardized. So ZigBee is uh, one of the oldest one. It's got really huge amount of materials, huge amount of things. Uh, it mostly was designed for Internet of Things, like before internet actually became a thing. Uh, it was designed for different sensors in uh, industrial, industrial sensors. And uh, it actually got a lot of capabilities in terms of routing. It got, uh, you, you can have really complex networks of big sensors with multiple masters uh, with mesh networks. All of them is available. And uh, big vendors like Google, uh, also do have their own specialized operation system that supports both of them, LoRa and the ZigBee. And the LoRa is a modern generation that was designed um, to be very power efficient, uh, very bandwidth efficient, so basically, and um, it's, uh, it got a lot of capabilities in terms of survival. It, 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 it can survive almost any kind of noise, and uh, uh, the chirp modulation used in LoRa allows it to do it quite efficiently. Uh, the only problem with LoRa is uh, that it's uh, mostly for Internet of Things. It's uh, for sensors that doesn't require like a lot of data to be sent back and forth. And then uh, there is uh, another attempt uh, to like turn the whole thing upside down. It is uh, by telecom vendors. Uh, those devices, uh, like in BOT and FP, you probably heard about that uh, in last recording speech that narrow band LT is coming soon. And uh, that's basically it. Uh, don't, don't difference that uh, uh, transceivers for all protocols that we saw before actually do cost like two, three USD maximum. And if you produce these devices on a scale, like one, one let's say 100,000 devices, the price for you will be closer to one USD. And if we're talking about solutions by telecom, 
they, they usually start from 10 to 20 USD. So it's, it's much more expensive, but much more sophisticated. So basically, the modem that will you, they, will be pro they will provide to you actually can send like a lot of data and it's not limited uh, as uh, other protocols and other devices is limited is. So, and now when we have like a basic understanding of what exactly we can find in real life, let's talk about reverse engineering those things. So, we'll talk about tools, about finding signal and its parameters, capturing and demodulating the signal, and then decoding payload and analyzing payload. So, it's it's really broad topic. Um, in, gen in general, today's uh, presentation is is not like a full complete guide that will be uh, usable from the beginning. Uh, you will need some additional knowledge, you need to find them. So what, what I will provide in this presentation today is uh, the keywords that you will need to search in order to understand how those things work and uh, how to learn the whole thing in a way that it, 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 will, it will have like a consistent image in your head. So once again, let's start with tools. Uh, if we're not developing things, we don't need, uh, let's say, vector network analyzer. Uh, and we don't need like a lot of other development tools. Uh, what we'll need is a spectrum analyzer, the way you define is radio or transceiver that allows you, some, some kind of transceiver that allows you to listen to some specific frequencies, some specific type of modulation. And uh, you can use Flipper Zero for that, or you can use uh, HackerF or any other tool that's available to you. So, in terms of software, what we'll need? Uh, one of the most popular is uh, Universal Radio Hacker. Uh, it's a software written in Python it's with a nice UI. It allows you to capture, uh, with software defined radio, allows you to capture the signal. And then uh, try to apply a different kind of uh, demodulators and get the payload from the signal. Uh, quite nice. And then you have like a whole spectrum of software defining radio tools. Uh, you have, uh, we have at least two different stacks. Like a, it's a really huge frameworks that allows you to build pipeline of processing radio uh, from different blocks. So it's a POTUS SDR and the GNU radio. Then we have um, uh, like UI tools like Cubic SDR. So it's basically it's a spectrum analyzer that uses software defined radio to capture uh, uh, what, what, what's going on the uh, radio waves. And then we have um, some specialized tools for sub gigahertz for, uh, like RTL433. Uh, so basically it's a command line tool that knows like a lot of different protocols and allows you to capture almost all of them and, and immediately demodulate, uh, get payload and get, in some cases, get data. And uh, in Flipper, we do have uh, Flipper Lab. Uh, so it's basically web uh, based, a set of web-based tools where you can uh, get your, for example, raw, subgigahertz raw signal, upload it to uh, flip it up and then visualize it. So, how can we find the signal in these parameters? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, for all devices uh, on the back, including Flipper, you have uh, FCC ID. So, FCC ID is a public database of all devices being certified for United States, and um, it's, it becomes quite handy because uh, I mean, the United States is the biggest market, and the most devices that you can buy is certified for that market. And you can find uh, in FCC ID like what frequencies this device can use for transmitting and receiving. And you can find even parameters for those different types of modulation. For example, if you have a frequency shift game where you have like a center frequency and deviation, uh, you can find like what deviation by seeing those graphs. And it becomes handy because uh, if you don't have software defined it radio, you will need this information uh, to properly configure your receiver. So what else uh, we will need? So once we have, for example, uh, the, 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 if we don't have those information, if we don't have, have FCC ID, what we can do? We can use a spectrum analyzer um, and we can s find the signal, find how it looks like. So for example, if it looks like just a one uh, straight line with uh, dots, so most likely it's on of king. If we see like a line, two lines, and jumping back and forth, it's a frequency shift gain. And if we see, oh, <laughs> we're almost in the end. 
Yeah, so the general idea is uh, check spectrum analyzer, uh, check how it looks like, and then uh, choose parameters and feed it to your receiver. So capturing includes like uh, configuring your receiver uh, with, with parameters that you found in the previous step, then recording all possible kind of signals. So record as many samples as possible. You will need them to analyze it further. And then demodulate it into bit stream. So on the next step, what we do, we apply some kind of line coding to decode the payload from this bit stream. And uh, then you do analysis, like see the structure, sizes. So usually have preamble and then you have, and then the, in some cases you have uh, some static bits that always present. Uh, in some cases you have like a serial numbers inside of uh, this payload. So you can kind of cast the part of the payload in the hex and see if it's matching to device number. Then you have uh, ECC, CRC. All of them is kind of findable there. Um, counters, if you have uh, devices with the protection from uh, reply attack, they usually do have a uh, counter that increments every time. And then you have, uh, if, you, if you're talking about weather stations, they have a sensor data. So if you know it's uh, kind of 20 degrees Celsius, you can try to find it inside of the payload. And button numbers, also things that can be easily read from that. So uh, if you're talking about pen test, uh, we have a um, couple different additional type of attacks that we want to do against the system. So the simplest one is uh, jamming, so basically, Jamming is using jammer against some frequencies. So what is jammer? Jammer is a frequency generator with a powerful power amplifier. And uh, basically, it's kind of trying, trying to erase your signal from being. And uh, wh when it's important, it's important when you design a system that about security, for example, alarms, uh, home alarms. And uh, if your home alarm doesn't react on jamming, then it's a badly designed home alarm. And most systems of the market is actually badly designed. They, they do ignore if sensor is not replying in time or if sensor is not transmitting anything at all. So what else we can do? Since we do have ability to record signals, we can try to replay them. For example, you have car and uh, someone is opening it and you record the signal. And if system uh, accepting this replay attack, then it's purely designed. Then you, you should fix it. Then brute force attacks. So basically, if you have limited spaces uh, for ID, you can just uh, go one by one and find uh, the number that will open the door for you. Also, something that's easy to implement and uh, quite useful. And then a lot of types of attacks that are actually protocol specific. So you have to understand what kind of thing inside of this protocol. So a couple of things to uh, look at is uh, service packets, authorization packets, how they handle it. Are they brute forceable? And uh, what can we, how can we mess with it? Is it, uh, um, is there some kind of denial of service attacks? Or maybe you can impersonate, uh, you can, for example, hijack some kind of token from another uh, device and use it for other, uh, for example, packets that you want to send. Also, weak encryption. In many cases, they don't have encryption at all. And you can listen for other receiver transceiver talking and then analyzing what they've been talking about. And uh, fuzzing, uh, since those systems is most likely embedded software, they usually tend to have quite, quite shitty code. And in some cases, it's susceptible for uh, injecting different noise in the bitstream. So, and I guess that's it. Um, so gigahertz itself is not going anywhere. It's uh, Something that is uh, slowly developing, it's slowly becoming more secure. And with protocols like uh, ZigBee and LoRa, it's becoming even more secure. But there are a lot of systems designed in the past century that wasn't that good and uh, there are issues with them. We will have to live with it. And uh, you can actually choose if you're buying those systems or not. And uh, I guess you, don't should, you, shouldn't have, you shouldn't buy it. Um, and then new generation of radio in general brings limitless possibilities like lower networks. And you basically can build like a huge network with a minimum amount of transceivers uh, that survives uh, post-apocalypse. It's quite nice. And uh, special thanks to Mikhail Popov who is, uh, uh, in, in our team we've been designing sub uh, subsystems with him. And uh, he's been reverse engineering uh, all kinds of systems for the last couple of years. Really thanks and uh, Flipper device team.
Uh, I'm not sure. We, do we have time? We don't really have time for questions? Well, I think we have like five minutes for maybe yeah. one or two questions. <laughs> so, anyone? Uh, questions and answers? Anyone? Yeah. Guys? No questions? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, really so. sorry for uh, making question. this uh, presentation dense. It's just, there are so many things that uh, I wanted to talk about, and uh, probably I could bring you a little bit more nice pictures to show what it is in real life. So, but this presentation will be available after, after the finish, and uh, you can use it uh, as a set of keywords that you need to search in order to get like a whole picture of sub giga get. So, so the question was, why the sub gigahertz range was chosen for the presentation? Oh, basically, uh, I gave a couple of topics like NFC, RP, sub gigahertz, and uh, I just and guys decided that it will be sub gigahertz. Yeah. And, and that's something that I mean. I mean, I'm only covering topics where I'm kind of uh, topics that I understand. So, last three years I spent designing Flipper and. Uh, Subgegers and the CR feed. This is those topics where I spend most of my time. And uh, it's kind of uh, sad that I'm not sharing this experience, so I decided to share it. So with the press part, I see that it's connected to your notebook, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's also got Bluetooth low energy ah, and. Uh, Bluetooth is more than Yeah, one yeah. Meter. And we, we have a specialized application that oh. allows it to allows it to, to be a keyboard, different kinds of keyboard. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we can also have like another topic if uh, Aku would like to join join us later. Of course, we can cover uh, like NFC or something else later. And yeah. So in case thank you guys you are interested, uh, sorry, just sorry. one one small question. Uh, thank you for presentation. It's all like inspiring and everything. It's so like new for me also as well. Um, I have like a really like non technical question. How to get one flipper zero in Japan? Japan, yeah, that's <laughs> one of the complex topics for us. We are looking for a partner in Japan who will do like a sales in it, but uh, no one wants to. <laughs> yeah, we, we're planning to open the shop for, for the rest of the world. Uh, closer to uh, New Year. So we're currently solving problems with logistics because n not all countries are um, easy to ship. Some of them like do have a lot of problems with customs in terms of they require a lot of certifications. So Flipper itself got all certificates that uh, needed for Europe, United States, American general. But the rest of the world is a little bit, and we also have certificate for Japan. So device itself is uh, fully compliant with Japanese laws, but the problem is that uh, we need some kind of partner who will do uh, the shipping, last mile shipping. Yes, we are planning to open it in the next month. Yet, uh, then this option will be available then. Uh, currently, we are accumulating uh, flippers on the, in the United States warehouse for New Year sale, holiday sale. So it will be op it will be open. So Amazon uh, flipper shop they will be open for United States. And if if you think that they do ship from United States to Japan, then it will be available. There is no restriction. On, okay, there is no restriction on our side. We we we're not planning to restrict uh, U.S. Amazon to some specific country. Okay, so unfortunately we don't have much time, but uh, thank you, Aku, and yep, thanks everyone. And hope uh, we see you in the future on the future events as well.